hi guys welcome back to my channel and if you're new then welcome my name is zoe a lot of you know me as ZA reptiles from instagram maybe also twitter but more than likely instagram so i know everyone has been waiting on an apartment tour from me and because it is taking so long i decided to make it up to you guys by giving you the video that you guys have been requesting for so long now so probably my most requested video and also my most requested care guide is for a Kenyan sand boa. And you guys know, and I've told a lot of you, that I do not make care guides for animals unless I feel fully confident in my care for them and if I've had them for about a year. Well, timing has come. I also told you guys I wouldn't do a video for Tootsie until I gave her an upgrade. She has her upgrade. It's been almost a year. I believe I got her in September, very, very early September of 2018. So we were only about two months away from her gotcha day. So I figured it's, it's about time. It is time that I give you guys what you have been asking for. Now I do want to enter a little disclaimer that I am by no means a expert. Do not take everything that I say like and perfectly replicate it without doing your own research. Okay, this video is just what I have done with Tootsie, what works for me, and what I have found from my research. This is a good source for you to use for your own research, but it should by no means be the only source you use. You should still go online, look at articles, look at other care guides, look at scientific papers, do more research than just watching one video, okay? Lots of ways to do things in the reptile world. Someone may disagree with the way that I do things. So you need to do your own research and decide for yourself what you are going to do and how you're going to care for your animal. So without further ado, here is my Kenyan sand boa care guide. So if you saw my corn snake care guide, I'm going to be following roughly the same layout for this video as far as the categories and how I'm going to talk about them. So I'm going to be starting off with just talking about general information regarding the Kenyan sand boa. So the Kenyan sand boa obviously comes from Eastern Africa in the areas like Kenya, Egypt, Sudan, those areas over there. So they also earned a second name being the East African sand boa. So you may hear them called the Kenyan sand boa, but because they live in more places than just Kenya, they're also called the East African sand boa. So Tootsie here is a normal sand boa. Um, there are many different morphs being bred now. You got Paradox, Snow, all sorts of different ones. Tootsie here is a normal, and the normals personally are my favorite. So the normals are just a like darkish brown chocolate and then an orangish yellow and this helps them camouflage into their surroundings. So as you may have guessed, the Kenyan sand boa lives in kind of drier, sandier, warmer areas. They don't live in like tropical rainforests or anything like that. So also going off of their patterns and their colors, fun fact, no two Kenyan sand boas are the same. So Kenyan sand boas are also pretty neat. Um, when it comes to breeding because they are live bearers, meaning that they don't lay eggs, they have live young. So now we're going to move on to the physical characteristics of these snakes. So these snakes are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males and the females are different. Males are much, much smaller than the females are. Males typically reach maybe 18 inches max where females can max out at about two feet. Um, occasionally, they can be reported being two and a half feet, but the average is about two feet. So what's also really cool about these guys is you can sex them without having to probe them. So a lot of the times to tell a snake's gender, you have to bring it to a vet, you have to probe it, and it can be stressful for the snake. And sometimes, unless you're going to breed that animal, it's almost not even worth it. Kenyan sand boas, you can tell the sex just by looking at them. So males and females will have 
different tails. So females will have, if you look from the vent to the end of the snake, that is what's considered their tail. Females will have kind of a shorter, almost stubbier tail, and males will have a much longer tail. So I am pretty sure that Tootsie is a female. I've been saying that Tootsie is a female and I'm hoping that Tootsie is a female. And I'm pretty sure based on her tail that Tootsie is a female. I will put a reference image right here so you guys can kind of see the difference between the males and the females and what that looks like. And, you know, Tootsie's tail is very resemblant of a female's tail. So, until she proves to me otherwise, I am still saying that she's a female. So, when I go and I do education programs, I bring Tootsie with me. She usually ends up being the fan favorite. And that is just because Kenyan sea and boas are so gosh darn cute. I mean, how can you not love them? They've got this little tiny shovel head that flattens and kind of comes to a point. And their eyes and their nose are on top of their head. So now the purpose for this, these snakes, you may have guessed by the name, being a sand boa, they spend most of their time burrowing underground. So having their eyes and their nose on top of their head as opposed to like on the sides or on the front or like normal snakes. They have it on top and this helps them with finding prey, hiding from predators because they can lay right under the surface and they have their eyes and nose on top to kind of aid them with their hunting or with their hiding and just protecting themselves and finding food and yada yada yada. Could be much harder for them if they were under the ground and had eyes on the side of their head instead of on top because you'd just be looking into the dirt as opposed to looking at the surface. So that is why they have the most cute adorable little derpy shovel head ever. So now just to end off this section I do want to say these are long-term pets like most reptiles like most snakes they will live for a long time. Now Kenyan sand bows especially have been reported to live about 30 years in captivity. So before you get a Kenyan sand boa, you need to be prepared to give 20 to 30 years to your sand boa, okay? Healthy sand boas should live to at least 15 years, at least, right around there, 15-ish years. So they are a long-term pet. Okay, so now that we've kind of got the basic information about sand boas out of the way, let's get into the care part of the sand boas, starting with their enclosure. So because these snakes are among the smaller species of snakes, they really do not need much room. A lot of people say that most sand boas can live comfortably in a 10 gallon tank, um, being you know males or smaller females, but typically just the males and females should live comfortably in a 20 gallon tank. Now, I don't believe in following minimum requirements. I believe the bigger the better, more naturalistic, more enrichment. Why go for the minimum? If you truly love your animal, give it a palace. Make it feel like a prince or princess. So I personally would not keep a sand boa in a 10 gallon tank. I would male or female go for a 20 gallon tank. So if you didn't want to go the tank route, you could also do a plastic bin, like a sweater bin, a shoebox bin, something like that. If you guys watched my Kenyan sand boa enclosure video, that was her, we'll call it her baby, her baby, her baby hangout, her baby crib, her, her baby enclosure. I kept her in like a little shoebox bin I got at Target. Really great. So I will link that video in the description below if you want to check that out, see how I did that for her. But she has grown quite a bit and she was looking a little big in there. So I finally gave her her upgrade. So her upgrade is a... I forget what it's called, a small, low exoterra or something like that. Um, it's 18 by 18 by 12 is what the dimensions are. So doing the calculations, the floor space comes out to be just a tiny bit smaller than a 20 gallon. It is much, much bigger than a 10 gallon. It's just a tiny bit smaller than what a 20 gallon would provide. So 
unless she becomes a humongous female, that tank should be perfect for her. So we'll see how she does. Right now it's kind of like a palace for her. So she's doing great in it. I'm loving the looks of it. It's so much easier to service than a tub. I hate things that open on the top, front opening. It's made my life so much easier. But yeah, so ideally for an adult, Kenya Samboa, a 20 gallon tank. Also, while we're on the topic of it, make sure that you lock your enclosures. You get a tank, get some lid locks, put something heavy, heavy, heavy on top. You know, if you have the front opening enclosures, they just lock anyway. What are you doing to my hair? Can you get out of my hair? Sand boas, they're not great climbers. So you can imagine they've got this heavy body that is not meant for climbing because they are terrestrial. So she can wrap around my fingers a little bit, but not to the point where she's gonna hold on. This is not a snake you'd wanna drape over your shoulders. They would fall right off. So they are not very good climbers. However, they can climb and they are escape artists. So it is very important that you lock your lids. Christmas Eve? Christmas Eve Eve. Um, we found out that she had escaped. I am very, very, very lucky that Christmas Eve night, my boyfriend went upstairs and found her slithering across the hallway. So I'm very lucky that it was him that found her, not any of my family that was visiting. Had my family known that she had escaped, they all would have went back home and we would have had Christmas by ourselves. All right, so now we're gonna talk about heating and lighting. So sand boas, as you can imagine, coming from Africa, like it pretty warm. So how do you provide heat? Personally, I like to use heat mats. Some people use ceramic heat emitters for overhead heat to mimic the sun. Um, I personally am very sick of lights and heat mats. Just, they look nicer because you can't see them. So I use heat mats for all of my snakes. Um, like I said, personal preference, pick what you want. But I use a heat mat. You should always use a thermostat. Always, 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 this controls your heat. So when it gets to the temperature you want it at, it shuts the heat off so that it does not get any higher. When it drops down, it turns back on, so it keeps it at a stable temperature. So for these guys, their basking spot or hot spot, hot side, should be about 90 to 95 degrees with a gradient to 80 degrees on the cool side. At night, they can drop down to like mid 70s. This is totally fine because in the wild, it is cooler at nighttime than it is during the daytime. So a slight temperature decrease is only natural. It's not gonna harm them. As long as it doesn't go below like mid 70s. So you really do not need to provide lighting for these guys. For all of my reptiles, I always do a 12-12 daylight nighttime cycle, but you don't need to provide extra lighting if you have natural light coming in. I have three windows in my living room right here. I have my rack right here with Tootsie on it and the lighting from the windows is plenty. It lets her know that it is daytime as opposed to nighttime. So I don't need to provide any extra lighting over her enclosure because the lighting, the natural light in this room is enough to let her know that it is daytime and not nighttime. So really and truly, you don't need to provide extra lighting for these guys. I mean, they're under their substrate most of the time anyway. So it's not like they would need to know. But yes, I do suggest a 12 hour cycle, natural lighting in the room is totally fine to provide that. So now we're gonna talk about humidity. So like I said, they come from warm, dry areas. They don't really require much in the way of humidity. However, you still wanna monitor their humidity because you wanna make sure that it's not gonna go above 30 to 40%. Because yes, for species that need a high humidity, not enough can cause respiratory problems but also too much humidity can also cause respiratory problems for species like this that don't require very much. Also, if you're using substrates like Aspen, too much humidity can actually like mold your Aspen and just make it not very sanitary and healthy. And you, just, you don't want, you don't wanna do it. Keep it dry, okay? Keep it dry, less than like 30 to 40%. Now when they're in shed, you do want to bump up the humidity a little bit the best thing to do is to provide a humid hide. 
So I've done a couple different things. I've used a Tupperware that I cut a hole in and put some wet moss in. Um, the last thing I did was I used a mason jar and I'm out of moss, so I just put a wet paper towel in. Both times I had a perfect shed from her. So there's no need to raise the humidity in the whole entire enclosure, just provide a humidide that they can seek out to help them shed. Okay, so now let's talk about substrates. So there are a couple things that I think are the best. I personally use Aspen. I know most people with Sambo's use Aspen. The other thing you can do is a bioactive setup. Now I haven't really done much research into this, but I know some people have done bioactive setups. Um, so if that was something you were interested in, definitely look that up, check it out. That's something I'll probably look at in the future. So we'll see if I end up doing that or not. But right now I use Aspen. It is great. It's great for burrowing. It holds their tunnels. It is fantastic. It soaks up whatever the pee and their feces. It soaks it up. Um, so it makes it for easy cleaning. You scoop it out. Um, a lot of people or some people use play sand because they are Canyon sand boas. It's in their name. I personally am not a hundred percent against using play sand. I do not believe their whole enclosure should be play sand. Um, I think maybe just part of it, like a corner or a little section just to kind of add some enrichment, switch it up a little bit to give them something different to dig around in. That way when you feed them, you can feed them in the aspen section or whatever substrate you're using. Because um, the argument is that play sand can cause impaction. It gets stuck to their prey a lot easier than something like aspen would, which is bigger. The sand particles are much more smaller and fine and just easier for the sand boa to ingest. So I'm not opposed to using play sand, I just think it should be in just a small area of the enclosure just to provide some enrichment and something different. I personally haven't done this, but it's something that I want to do for Tootsie and that I am planning on doing and that I would have done when I got her up upgrade, except I ran out of play sand when I did Kronk and Crikey's new enclosures, so I have to get more. Um, but yeah, so play sand, okay, as long as you don't use the whole entire or you don't make the whole entire enclosure play sand, um, maybe just a little corner, um, see how your bow does with it. But Aspen is my number one pick for substrates for sand boas. So you want to avoid things like coconut mulch, newspaper, paper towel, reptile carpet. Never use pine or cedar for any of your reptiles. But especially for this species, you don't want to use things like paper towel, newspaper, or carpet because they are a burrowing species. I believe that as the caregiver, it is your job to be able to provide them with the ability to showcase their natural behaviors. In this case, burrowing. They cannot burrow in newspaper, reptile carpet, and paper towel. So you want to provide them with a substrate that they can burrow in because that is what they are meant to do. Again, that's why I use aspen. And then pine and cedar are just not good for your animals anyway. They'd be toxic and just harmful. Do not use them for any of your animals. Also calcium sand. Never use calcium sand. Please just don't do it. So now let's talk about their interior design. This is everybody's favorite part of getting a new animal is getting to set up the inside of the enclosure. So sand bows don't need much, okay? You're basically, if you get one, you're gonna have an enclosure and the enclosure full of substrate is basically going to be your pet. For the most part, you won't even know that you have a sand boa in there. So they really don't need much. You know, provide your hides, your warm hide, your cool hide. If you want to add a little decoration just for, just to please your eye, then go for it. But they really don't need it. Um, so just typical warm hide, cool hide, water dish. Their water dish, you want to make sure it is sturdy so that when they are burrowing underneath, it's not something super light that they're gonna tip over and knock over. Also, when you're adding decorations in, you wanna make sure you're not putting anything too, too heavy in because if they are burrowing underneath it and eventually cause, let's say, like an avalanche, I don't know what better word to use, but like an avalanche, and the whatever decoration that you have in just comes down on top of them, it's gonna smush them 
and could potentially injure them or even kill them. So you want to make sure whatever you have in there is going to be safe for your boa to burrow underneath. You don't want it to be anything that will squish them should it just come down on them. So now let's talk about feeding. Just like any snake, you want to make sure you're only feeding them a prey item that is about the size of the thickest part of their body. The awesome part about sand boas is they're so little that you'll never have to go off of anything bigger than mice. You won't feed rats. Typically just a smaller mouse does the trick for their whole life. So they are ambush predators, like I said. They lay in wait, that's why they have their eyes on top of their heads, so they can see food and then come up ambush it. In the wild, they may actually drag their prey underneath the sand to suffocate it and eat it that way, which is pretty cool, if I do say so myself. But generally, they are pretty good eaters in captivity. Sometimes they can be a little difficult. Tootsie here would be my easiest animal, hands down, if it wasn't for her eating habits. So Tootsie is a shy eater. She does not like to tongue feed. She doesn't like anyone to be around when she eats. So what I have to do is I kind of have to unbury her a little bit to show her the mouse and then I leave it there for her to eat. Um, I always brain it just because that's how she eats it. I don't want to not brain it and find out she's not gonna eat it. It's easier for me to just brain it and leave it for her. Okay, and then I have to leave. I have to walk away. I can't be watching her because she will not eat if you are watching her. So sometimes they can be shy eaters. Um, sometimes they can just be a little picky. But generally, a lot of people say that they don't have a problem feeding theirs, that they're good eaters. I just got kind of a pain in the butt. So now let's talk about handling. As you can see for this whole video, I pretty much only used one hand for her. They're very easy to handle because they're so small and they're so slow moving. They're just very easy to handle. However, because of the fact that they are not climbers, you do have to be cautious when you're handling them, like I said, to make sure that they're not gonna flop off your hand. You wanna make sure that you are supporting them at all times. Also be cautious if you're wearing anything with sleeves because they will try to burrow into your sleeve. I have lost her up sleeves of long sleeve shirts, sweaters, hoodies, etc. So just be cautious of what you are wearing when you are holding them. So I'm just going to end this video talking about whether or not you should get a Kenyan sand boa. So Kenyan sand boas are great for beginners because they are very docile, they have great temperaments, they're easy to handle, they stay small, they don't need a huge enclosure, they don't need a ton of decoration. Typically they're good eaters and they don't need anything bigger than mice. Usually I think about a hopper is the biggest that you'll need. So. Financially, they're very good. I mean, the normal snake or the normal sand boas are not expensive by any means. She was my least expensive snake, hands down, so far. So financially, they are very good for beginners. The downside, however, is that unless you're sitting there all night watching them, you're probably not going to see them very often because they spend all their time underneath the substrates. So if you want a snake that's going to be super active, that you're going to get to see all the time, maybe a sand boa isn't for you, but if that doesn't bother you and you just want to start getting into keeping snakes, you think they're pretty cute and you know, you just want the experience of having a snake and you're prepared for a long-term commitment, don't forget I said they are a long-term commitment, then definitely look into getting a sand boa. I mean, I love Tootsie despite the fact that I don't see her very often. She's a great snake. She's great for my education programs. She's great with other people and everybody loves her. So that was my Kenyan sand boa care video. I apologize for making you guys wait so long, but I wanted to make sure that I was very confident in my care of her before I talked to other people about how I care for her. I wanted to make sure that what I was doing worked and that I felt confident in it and that I felt and so part of that was just waiting and I wanted to get her out of her baby enclosure I wanted to get her in a real adult Kenyan sand boa enclosure and have her for almost a year before I talked to you guys about her so 
that's why it took so long but i'm glad the time finally came that i could finally talk to you guys about her and about her care and i hope you guys enjoyed so if you did please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any more videos and feel free to leave a comment if you have any other questions or you know if you have a sand boa let me know and as always thank you for watching and we'll see you for the next video